Welcome to DockerCon. I am Taylor Brown. I'm a program manager on the Windows team. Um, and among other things, I own containers, but also our server developer strategy. So I think a lot about how do we uh, help people develop on, on Windows Server, how do we make them effective doing that, uh, what makes them happy when they're doing development. Um, and so this is a great show for me to be at, because I love, uh, love coming to DockerCon and hearing what people are doing. Hi, I'm Steve Lasker. I'm a program manager on our developer tools. So I work on our Visual Studio tools for containers, uh, the Azure Container Registry, and I work on our end-to-end -end story uh, for containers through development, through production. Uh, so I've been working with Taylor and the Docker folks for two years, I think, now. Uh, it's kind of weird when you start looking at old things in GitHub to see how long ago you started working on some of these things. Uh, but I also just really enjoyed coming here and, and seeing the breadth of stuff that people are doing. So. With that, hopefully we'll work, talk about a little bit of enabling you to do a breadth of stuff, including the old stuff that you might have had. So as we get started, I always try to get the slides available ahead of time. So feel free to grab the slides, take a look at it. If uh, you look through the slides and you're like, hey, you know, this isn't the session for me, you can give us a great review and uh, have a nice time, <laughs> go find another session. Um, if this is the right session for you, welcome. If you're gonna go back and give a presentation to your team, steal the slides have at it, um, you know, make them your own, do whatever you need to do. Um, also on that same site, there's all of uh, my other previous presentations around containers, so uh, feel free to, to grab and steal. Um, and then Steve also put up um, a link to the demos that we'll be doing. So again, a great place to uh, borrow some content uh, for, for your next uh, set of uh, talks. As we think about you know, why containers uh, have become so popular, um, you know, I think there's a couple big influences that have really accelerated that adoption. Um, availability being one of the first ones. So we're now living in a world where things just are expected to be up all of the time. Uh, we've gotten used to going to uh, our e-commerce site and getting access to whatever product we want delivered to our house in two hours. Uh, we've gotten used to being able to transfer money at any time in the middle of the night. We've gotten used to uh, accessing the news. And it's just really not acceptable to not have something up all the time anymore. And that even happens in our in our day-to-day -day world, in our enterprise jobs. So if I come to work on a Saturday, which I often do, um, I expect that everything's going to be still working. I should be able to send emails. I should be able to uh, access our SharePoint sites. I should be able to get access to code. Like, none of that stuff should be down. Um, even if we're doing a migration, right? So everybody expects things to be up all the time. We're also expected to be able to scale things up and down at the blink of an eye. If we get a huge spike in, uh, in traffic, um, we announce some cool thing at DockerCon and people go nuts, well, we should be able to handle that traffic instantly. At the same time, if we're not getting busy, uh, we're not getting a lot of traffic, then we're expected to scale down and reduce costs. We're expected to be able to do those things. We're expected to be able to move things between environments. If we get a better deal from another cloud vendor tomorrow, we're expected to be able to take advantage of that and move over to that, to that other environment. We're expected to be able to move things between on-prem and the cloud. Um, and back again, as, uh, as rules change, as regulations change, uh, this ability to move things around and live in a hybrid world and have that agility are incredibly important. Right? And what we found from containers is that they deliver on a lot of these goals for us. We've done studies. We can show 62% reduction in resolution times using containers. Right? We can show the ability to move things across clouds at an incredibly rapid rate, much, much easier than we've ever done before. You know, We all think that it's just a VM. We can just move a VM, right? It's easy. We can move a VM from uh, AWS to Azure. Well, yeah, and sort of, but all the scripts that we use to deploy it are different. Uh, the environment's different. The file types are different. So it's really not that easy to move VMs around. Right? There's tools that can do it, and we can buy those, and great. Um, what's been magical about containers is it's standardized so much of that. It's just a container image. We just do a Docker pull on the other site, and the container image is there. And yeah, we may have to update some stuff around IP configuration, but even that's becoming easier and easier, and we're reducing the amount of that we have to do. So we can move things around much, much easier. But including like even on-prem to the cloud too, right? We're not trying to do the cloud of the week kind of thing too, but a lot of people have stuff on-prem that 
trying to get it moved into the cloud, any cloud, becomes a lot of differences. Uh, getting things into containers has turned out to be a really good way to kind of lift and shift my workloads, and then I don't have to worry about the uniquenesses of the cloud. Uh, and then the ability to release faster. And you know, it's funny, I go talk to a lot of enterprise customers, and I say, you know, you can release 13 times faster. And they're like, well, well they want to release faster. <laughs> like, what? Well, that doesn't sound like a good thing. I have to test more often. Right, but they're thinking about it in the terms of the world that they're living in today, which is that a release is like this massive thing, and there's a PR mm -hmm. deal, and you know, I've got to go repackage the box, and someone's going to want to change the logo, and we've got to recertify, and all of this stuff. And when you start living in the world of, well, we can release every time there's a change, because the change might just be as simple as fixing a, a minor bug that someone was annoyed by, instead of accumulating those into huge change sets that have to then go through huge QR passes and figure out, like, oh, well, that change we made six months ago to fix that minor bug regressed something that's actually blocking an entire year's worth of development activities. Well, I guess we got to go back and fix that bug. Oh, when we fix that bug, now we regress something else. And we get into this cycle where we're just spinning on fixing and fixing and fixing. And our bug fix times become longer than our QA or than our development times. And all of a sudden, we're not agile anymore. When I can just tell a developer, yeah, go fix that, push the container image up. If it doesn't work, we'll revert the container image. And it's not a big deal. I've increased our agility considerably, right? And so for a lot of these reasons, we're seeing containers adoption just take off. Uh, we're certainly seeing it with Windows. Since we uh, released Windows Server 2016 last year, um, my workload has increased exponentially, uh, talking to customers about how they're actually using containers, which is the best kind of job you can ever have. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy to be able to do that. But it is amazing to see how many people are adopting containers already on Windows. And we knew they would. We saw it on Linux. We saw people using it. Do I actually have to go through what is a container? I think we're here. We kind of figured that out. All right. Skip, skip, skip. Skip. Hey, hey what do you know? <laughs> All right. The house I kind of, of figured that that might be a little bit repetitive, but, you know, just in case. So why, you know, why Microsoft and Docker, right? Um, you know, we talked about we've been working with Docker for three years. Why, why have we been working with Docker for three years? Why did, why did that happen? Well, it came out for a number of reasons, right? We really, really, really wanted to have a great Windows developer experience. And we saw how developers were starting to use Docker on Linux. And three years ago, it was still a fairly small movement, right? Uh, but you could see the power that was starting to emerge out of that. And we saw a great opportunity to take some of the work that we were thinking about doing and enable people to, to use that. Um, and I kind of like to tell a story. We, Go into uh, to San Francisco and sat down with Solomon, and I was happy. I had my little spec, and I'm like, "Hey, we're gonna do this thing. Like, here's some APIs. You guys should like call the these APIs, and it'll be great. Docker will work on Windows, and it's gonna be, oh, it'll be awesome." And he looked at us and kind of said, oh, "Yeah, you know, Docker's in the open source. You guys can just go do the work." I was like, "Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. I wonder how that's gonna work out." Um, and we did. We went back and we figured out how to how to enable that. Um, and so at this point, we've really got a pretty good experience across Linux and Windows. Um, there's still definitely some things where we're adding in Windows to, to catch up to where, uh, where Linux is in terms of, of Docker containers. And there's actually a few areas now that I can happily say, like, we've got something that Linux doesn't have. Um, like, we've got storage quality of service support that we've added in, right? That'll be an easy thing to, to pick up in Linux as well, but it's areas where we're starting to see that, that great kind of cycle. We add something. Linux adds something, Linux adds something, we add something, and so everybody's getting lifted up because of it, right? Hybrid is a huge thing for, for us uh, at Microsoft. This is part of our, our DNA. Um, so as we do Azure, and now we're uh, getting ready with Azure Stack. So Azure Stack is in uh, technical preview now. Azure Stack allows you to use the power of Azure on-prem, completely disconnected, uh, but use the same development tools. So you can use the same templates, the same deployment scripts, the same processes and procedures on-prem. And then connect that into Azure as well, right? So hybrid is something that we've just been doing uh, at Microsoft for a very long time, and it's very important to us. We also have a huge history of applications. Something like 70% of all applications run on, on Windows. And a lot of those are monolithic-style applications. They're things that people have bolted onto and bolted onto and bolted onto year after year after year. How many people have worked with a big monolithic app? Yeah? It's not much fun, is it? It gets hard. You, you start to bolt more stuff on, and it gets even more cumbersome, and weird stuff breaks, and you don't even know who wrote that code. And you go look at it, and you're like, what is this stuff doing? Like, I, and you try to fix it, and then it gets even worse. 
Um, and so this movement towards you know, microservices, how do we modernize that application, uh, is something that we're, we're very, very well uh, tuned to and talking with a lot of our customers about that path right now. And we'll actually show some of that here a little later. Um, and then, of course, any language. Windows has a, a huge history of .NET, and we love our .NET customers. We love .NET. Uh, but we have a lot of people who write Java, C++, Node, Python. We have all sorts of different languages. And the more we embrace the so language. any system, language just isn't .NET and Java? Yes, yeah. <laughs> there are more than just those two. Um, but you know, we see a lot of, of power there. So one of the things that you know, we think about in, um, is what is that full cycle, right? It's really great when you start thinking about, hey, I can get Docker running, I get it run locally, I do a Docker build, Docker run. Um, but we really want to think about what that full life cycle is. And so you know, working on this for the last two years and working with people that are like far ahead in containers and working with people trying to figure out what is this container thing, one of the things we've seen is this common DevOps workflow. And this is part of the map that we work to enable. And one of the things is you're starting to work with Docker and you're doing your development and the first thing is your Docker file has a from statement. So you need to pull it from a registry. It might be Docker Hub uh, for public images or you might have a private registry that you set up in your environment on-prem or in the cloud. But we do the traditional thing where we're pushing source but the source includes these Docker artifacts, right? Our Docker file, our Docker compose files, the things that we need to be able to build. And, and now with the multi-stage build, things get even easier as well. We'll do our build systems, but the build system is actually gonna start building images and pushing it to that registry. And then what you're deploying is not the code, but configurations to your compose to be deployed. And one of the things that you know, we're starting to see is containers are becoming this new binary of deployment. And I can deploy across a whole collection of things. These are just some of the things that we have in Azure. And uh, working on the container registry, I hear every day another team is coming up and using containers and they, you know, at, in Azure as a, either a first class concept where you deploy a container image or they're running things as containers to get them at scale. And the idea is, uh, you know, because of all of these microservices are running, I want to get visibility into all of that. So we have a bunch of tools that we provide uh, and platforms, and I'll talk about the breadth of that as well uh, with the stuff with Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, and we're doing work in Eclipse and IntelliJ as well. This one is an interesting slide because it, it does come across as complex because it is a complex world. And to Solomon's point, we really do want to simplify things as you would work on it. So if you think about this, we've kind of broken this up a little bit on the more traditional-ish Windows stack on the left, but, and the open, more the community open source kind of stuff on the right where Linux containers and Windows containers is that separator there in the middle. Um, but you can, we're doing work in VS and VS Code and IntelliJ, and if you're using Jenkins, that should be the thing that you can use. We're not trying to move everything into one particular stack. This is very much an interchangeable model. And then when you get down to the container hosting, you're seeing that there's a lot of choices, and this is the choices that I get to work on. I actually sit in a pretty fun place, because working with you know, Taylor for Windows or Scott Hunter for .NET, but also working with the Azure teams and everything we're doing there, we want you to pick Windows and .NET. We have a great platform, but if you don't, that's okay as well. We get to enable that because that's what makes the polyglot, you know, the containers and polyglot environments really productive. So I luckily get to work on all of that stuff. It's a lot of fun. So what I'm gonna do is actually walk through one of those paths with the work we've been doing with Visual Studio uh, 2017. And what we've got here is uh, a traditional-ish uh, .NET app. It was ASP.NET, it was MVC, it's what people are probably using today. How many people are have .NET apps today? Okay, so now putting them in containers, what does that look like? One of the nice things about Docker is I can actually move my configuration into it. So the first thing that we've done, and this is we just add Docker support. And this will take a look at what your project is based on. And where'd it go? Oh, there it goes. It's thinking about it. It's thinking, yeah. Um, so we know that this is a .NET framework app. 
We can tell by looking at the project. We know that you need IIS. We're going to give you an IIS image that's already got everything set up. In fact, we just look at this image on, here we go, Microsoft ASP.NET. We already have Windows Server, .NET Framework, and then IIS in there as well that's configured. So there's no complex PowerShell scripts to set things up, put writes, you know, the bases are there. But your app might depend on WCF. It might depend on some configuration. So when you're making a change to that app, the first thing, what do you do when you need to enable some of these features? Right? Literally, what do you do? You have your ops people that you've got to like give them this paper. I, it was funny seeing that paper pulled out. Like that's the paper you have to hand off to your ops person or an email or something that says, hey, make sure all these things are installed. But now you as developers can put that configuration inside your Docker file, inside your app, and now you own that. And then all they have to do is run those containers. So it really puts a lot of power back into the developer's uh, lap there. So now I've got you know, my app that has its dependencies. I've got it configured here. Uh, that's awesome. But I might want to add some new functionality, right? So .NET Framework is great, but I want to be able to use .NET Core. There's some cool stuff happening with Core. And, or more importantly, I've got some feature requests that people have been asking me to put in this app, as Taylor was talking about, that I really don't want to go work in this old app. I want to use the new tech. So what I can do now with containers, I can get this complete isolation, and I can just say add new project, and I'm going to do a CRM thing here. So I'll say ASP.NET Core, and we'll see, say CRM SBC, let's say. And this is the, the .NET Core templates, and I can choose API. I can able, even enable Docker support uh, right here, but I want to show a new thing that we'll be shipping uh, in preview just in two weeks, a couple weeks for a build. So now, one of the challenges, .NET Framework is great because it can run that in a Windows Server container, but .NET Core, I want to be able to enable that as well. So I'll say add Docker support, and now because .NET Core runs on Windows and Linux, I actually get a choice. Which one do I actually even want? So I'll choose Windows, and I'll get a Docker file here that is the nano-based image for nano server. This is our cloud-optimized Windows OS. And you'll look at pretty much everything else is the same. You don't see IIS here because one of the things is when I'm running in a container, I don't need IIS as the host, right? I can get something else in front of it and use something much more lightweight and just run my code. One of the things you'll also see is coming soon, we don't have it fully yet, is what we call the multi-arc support. So I can actually use a single image and it'll determine whether it's running on Windows or Linux and pull the right one. That's so, kind of hard reason, isn't it? Huh? That's going to get a little harder now, isn't it? Yeah, it does get. It's like, which one do you want? Wait a second. And especially now with, yeah, with yeah. the Linux stuff we just announced when you can run both at the same time. So this is where we have a little bit more work to do to figure that out. So all that's great, so now I've got two, and I can go and write all that code to integrate those two, but I'm not going to waste your time to do that. I'll switch over to what's already running here. So this is my uh, updated version. And if we look in the compose, actually, I didn't really show it here, hold on. Uh, the Docker compose. So in addition to the Docker files, we're also adding the compose files so that you are set up for doing production work, right? So that's your production file. And when I added CRM service, it added it in there. And we've also added, we wanted to make sure that the VS specific configurations that I need during debugging is separated so you don't accidentally try to deploy that. We have a, a convention for just vs.debug.yaml. And then this is the VS goo, which will also get to go away soon, but it has the debugger and other goo in there. If I switch over to this one, what you'll see here is, you know, the cleaned up version there for the production. But if we look, how many of you guys have apps that have, don't have to write to anything? They just completely stand on their own. They have no persistent state. Yeah, that's a fun question to ask when people don't want to raise their hand, right? Was, of course, we're writing to something, especially these. Are, I mean, it's writing to SQL Server, right? I mean, and it could be any service. Well, one of the nice things with SQL running in a container is when I'm running locally in development, I can just run SQL in a container here locally, and when I hit F5, I will get that database reset to whatever I decide it to be. 
I don't have to, you know, call out to something remote. How many but people like installing SQL on their desktop, on their dev box? No, okay, neither. same thing. Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants Couple to raise hours. their hand anyway. So now what I can do is, and let's just switch over here. And in fact, if I, well, I, uh, Docker PS, we can see that I'm already running the SQL Server instance, my web front end, and the CRM service. And if I come over to my app, and I just, you know, we can create a new post, we can, new visitor here, this is, you know, all running locally. And then if I go in, and I click to test the CRM functionality, notice that I've hit a breakpoint, right? I'm running in a container. I could see by the selection of the web project, that's there, I've already got that breakpoint hit. I can get all of the capabilities that I would expect from Visual Studio, but I'm running containers. This is the, the model that, you know, the simplicity, we have a lot of complexity that's going on here, but we wanted to make it natural for you. So, and when I hit continue, because I have a breakpoint in the other container, right, this is a whole other container. It's another process, another OS, right, another instance. I'm able to break into each one and debug that multi-service app. I love how Donovan talks about it. With multi-container uh, uh, opportunities, you have multi-container challenges, uh, you have to be able to troubleshoot these things. So now, right there in Visual Studio, we've done just the thing that you would kind of expect uh, that happens to use containers but we've integrated it tightly so it's the experience that you expect from Visual Studio, but then when you're looking up docs on Docker, you're gonna get the information you expect. There's nothing really unique from us. This is a standard compose file. Even the debugging overrides are standard. The Docker files are standard. There's nothing unique here that we're doing. We're taking advantage of features of Docker, for instance, the build arg because as you heard a little bit in the keynote, we want to have optimized images, something we've been working on for a long time with compiled languages like .NET and Java, um, as opposed to like, uh, interpreted languages like Node and Python. So here you're going to take the published output and copy it in. So just a little bit of a demo there. Um, the .NET Core that targets Nano is actually not yet available. That'll be available in preview at the build event coming. Uh, but I wanted to give you a preview of that. You can actually do that with Linux today, um, but we'll add Nano so we have a full Windows stack there. Uh, so just from additional you know, stuff here, so running SQL in a container is just an awesome thing for the developer experience, right? I, and for testing, too, right? I can actually rerun my tests from the same state every time. I get that productivity, and it resets in the same plot. Running SQL in production, you know, we have great PaaS services that take care of that. So, you know, I don't want to ever say never, but, you know, this is a great sweet spot for running databases in a container. Uh, and they've, you know, done some great work here with uh, overall and SQL as a whole with, the, you know, most secure, highest performance. Uh, they just, you know, for relational databases, they're just, you know, continuing to really kill. Uh, while I didn't get a chance to show it, just for the sake of time, we also do a lot of work in Visual Studio Code. Right? It's not all about .NET. We're in a polyglot world. It might be Node, it might be Python, it might be Go. And we wanted to provide a tooling experience that's consistent with the choice of editors you're using. In Visual Studio, you're used to visual gestures. In Visual Studio Code, or VS Code, because we don't like to use the word visual part there, it's a code editor. And we try not to do visuals. It's a very interactive terminal. So there you can see the Docker syntax being popped in a, in a command line uh, interface, in the terminal interface. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, and we have a bunch of images that we're maintaining on uh, Docker Hub to provide you that base point. But as you saw with the Docker file that I showed, the idea is you start from that, but you're probably gonna optimize your own images for your environment save those images to your private registry, uh, whether it be in Docker Hub or private registry stood up in your environment, we have the Azure Container Registry uh, there as well. So let me get you back to Taylor here. Thanks, Steve. I, mean, I just kind of want to highlight a couple of the things that, that Steve showed. So taking your existing solution file, .NET 4.5, ASP.NET 4.5, 4.6, 3.5, whatever it is, taking that individual Studio 2017, right-click, add Docker support. Right? It's, it's really become that easy to get started with uh, containerization, right? Um, now, if you're a customer that has uh, an application that you don't need to do any source change to, we've got some great tools for that as well. 
Uh, image to Docker has become uh, a really, really awesome tool for moving applications without really changing source code. Um, actually, right now, there's some customers talking about that. Uh, so you'll have to catch that on the recording. But uh, we've got some really great tools either way. So this slide might look a little familiar. Um, we added a, back a few of the details in there. So when we think about how Windows containers work, we start with uh, kind of our user mode, right? Which has got the Docker engine and containerd and the Windows kernel. If you replace the word Windows there with Linux, it would look exactly the same. At this level, everything uh, that we're doing is really uh, the same. When we actually start a container, all we're doing is we're running that, that container, we're calling into, um, into our kernel APIs, into our system APIs to create a container from, uh, from the Docker engine through soon to be containerd, uh, that's work that we're, we're part of and working on, uh, to create that container, right? And of course we can run multiple of these containers side by side and they can share the same kernel. Now as we talked about earlier today, we also have this mode where we use Hyper-V isolation. So what we do is we run this specially optimized virtual machine and run the container inside of that. A couple key points on this. It is the exact same container. We run the exact same code inside of that VM. The reason we do that is so that these are 100% compatible. So do I have to do anything to my Docker file nope. to make this different? Nope. As an admin, you can override it at the host level or you can do it on a per container basis. If you're using Windows 10, you're always using a Hyper-V isolation. So Why? the images I push to the registry? Same. Yep, Very same cool. image, no change. And the reason we use Hyper-V isolation on Windows 10 is so that when you're developing, you're actually using the Windows Server kernel. The Windows Server kernel and the, and the Windows kernel are the same code base, but they run with different configuration parameters. Things like memory management policies are different. Scheduling parameters are different. 90% of the time, that's not gonna matter to anyone in the world. It's gonna run a little faster in, in production than uh, in, in development or a little different. I don't like 10% chances. <laughs> I want stuff if 10% to run. of all the planes failed, yeah. that, that's not a good I don't thing. think I'd be flying right now, <laughs> yeah. So we, op we, we use this mode. We also use this mode when we want to run things in, in a more isolated manner. We want to use a different version of the kernel. Uh, we have some regulatory requirements, like PCI and, and some of those where we say, ah, oh, we have to have uh, hardware isolation. Okay, check, but it's the same Docker command. And then what we showed today, we'll be adding Linux container support to this mix as well. And so this will enable us to run Linux containers side by side with Windows containers on Windows Server and on Windows 10 in the future, right? We so announced making that whole choice of like cats and dogs, just like a They can just all play yeah. together now. And then we throw Bash in there, we throw all this other stuff, and it's like, holy crap, uh, it's just gotten crazy. <laughs> um, we showed this today early. We showed the very early prototype of this for one very simple reason. We're doing this work in the open source. We needed to be able to collaborate with people as we build it. So you're, you're gonna start seeing the work come into the open repos over the next um, you know, couple weeks, couple months and you'll start seeing builds with the support coming out later this year. But we're really excited about uh, the possibilities this is enables for, uh, for developers, right? It just means you just get to use whatever's the best tool for the job. You don't have to worry about is that Windows or is that Linux. And then for things like uh, what Steve showed with Visual Studio, I can now compare side by side .NET running on Linux and Windows. Pick the one that works best, right? And if it happens to be Linux, let me know why, and we'll make the team work harder. We'll just make it better. Um, so we talked a little bit about the two different operating uh, system images or container images that we ship today. We have Nano Server and Server Core. Server Core is our high compatibility. It's big. It's the it is Server Core. It's compatible, uh, but it is really compatible. We have customers taking code from Windows 2003 and moving it into. Uh, server 2016 on server core without changing a single line of code. Who's got an ASP app? Not .NET, an ASP app. Yeah. My condolences, I am sorry. <laughs> this is a great option for they you. They did a great job coding in the first place. Yeah, they didn't, there you it's go, still yeah. running. Um, and then we've got Nano Server, which is really our target for born in the cloud application. So smaller footprint, uh, reduced API set, but really targeted to run things like .NET Core, Node, uh, these kind of, uh, of run times uh, incredibly well. Um, and both of these are paths that we're continuing to work on. We just did our first release. We got lots in store. The Linux container is just the first part. But wait, there's more. But yes, there is more. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, and then we've got the Azure Container Service where we can run this stuff in, in production. So the Azure Container Service has um, a, very, a very unique 
capability compared to other container services. It runs the open source versions of, of these projects. It runs your choice of DCOS, Swarm, uh, and Kubernetes. You get to pick. And all the code to build that is in the open source as well. Why does that matter? Well, when we talked about hybrid before, and we want to run things on-prem and into the cloud, now we can run the exact same version with the exact same configuration on-prem as what we're going to run in the cloud. And it's all through your, your choice. So why do I care about the Azure Container Service? Because if something goes wrong, I can call 1-800-MICROSOFT, and we'll figure it out, and we'll work with you to fix it, and we'll support it. And you get that turnkey experience around it, right? So this is a great way to be able to do all of these things. We've done a ton of work to make our command line experience and our APIs around this as friendly as possible so you can write really great deployment scripts, whether you're an operations team, deploying new instances of it, or a developer who's interacting with it. And the Cloud Console is now enabled in yeah. Azure, too. That's pretty cool. Yeah, if you haven't played with the Cloud Console, you've got to give that a try. Uh, that allows you to just go right into the Azure portal and get a Bash uh, console to interact with, uh, with Azure. And Windows is coming. And, yeah, we'll and Windows is coming. PowerShell is coming. But Bash is there already. Um, then we've got the Azure App Service. The App Service is really targeted at deploying an application. So traditionally, we would see this as, I'm going to go in and publish my .NET app to Azure. Right? And it would come up and it would publish that. And it's a PaaS service. And it would just take my .NET code and run it. And it continues to do that. But we've added container support to it as well. So now I can package up a single container, shove it up to App Service, and it will run that single container for you. And this is like exactly the problem. Like, How many of you were trying to deploy to App Service, but you had a dependency that App Service didn't let you install? And you were forced to go out to VMs. So now we can do this by doing that MSI exec, doing the register of 32. Well, actually, it's Linux containers, so it's a little yeah. weird. But um, you can now package your dependencies in the container. And so if we, you know, we look at the Azure Container Service, great for multi-container applications, broader scale. Azure App Service, you've got those single, single container apps, those monoliths that you just need to get running in the cloud. Super awesome experience, very, very straightforward. Um, and then we've got Service Fabric for really as a, a microservice platform. So this is a, a platform that we've been using to build things in Azure for a very long time. Very, very well optimized for building new applications using things like reliable collections and, and things like that, which has uh, Windows and Linux support as well. And we've got Azure Operations uh, Management Suite, which has now got great Docker support in it for uh, monitoring everything. And what I love about Operations Suite is it gives us a really nice view of everything. So I may be using Docker Data Center to monitor the containers, as well as Operations Management Suite to monitor the entire environment. So if I'm using that on-prem, and I've got a switch that fails or some storage that fails, OMS is going to be intelligent and tell you where that failure is, as opposed to hey, my containers are down. So in conjunction with the two, you get some really, really great insights. Um, and so they're, they're really great tools together. And this is actually where we're pulling in application insights as well from the application stack. We have a larger Azure monitoring effort where we're trying to give this one consolidated view. Uh, and one of the things that's nice is the things that you put in your app will just start lighting up that says, by the way, this code was running in this container as this service. So you can actually start to troubleshoot that on the app map. So we're definitely integrating all those together. And so what we've you know, kind of talked about today is really a, a lot of the breadth of solutions that we have. This actually is a hard talk to put together because we've got so much going on. Um, and I apologize to all the other teams at Microsoft that we haven't mentioned as, uh, as much as we probably could have. But it really takes us from the developer all the way into the cloud. So we've done integration in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Uh, we're doing integration in the operating system with Windows containers, now Linux containers, with Bash, with all of these different tool sets. We're doing integrations into Azure and Azure Stack. We're doing integrations into app services. We're building container images at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, last <laughs> week, crazy. WCF got published. New, yet another new option. Um, and we're just continuing to see those, uh, those choices explode. The Azure Container Registry uh, available we just now. GA, yep. yeah. just general availability. Um, so, you know, just an incredible amount of things coming to our ecosystem. Um, we'll be continuing to update Microsoft.com slash containers uh, to try to call out all of these new things. Uh, and then coming pretty soon, we'll be at Build. Build is our developer conference. So we'll be talking about a whole bunch of new uh, technologies that we're going to be uh, starting on and some of them that we're going to be releasing into production uh, at Build as well. So with that, we've got five minutes for questions. <laughs>
So what kind of things would we expect not to work in a container compared to a VM? Um, so a couple of good examples. Things that have uh, kernel drivers, right? Because often we're in a shared kernel environment, right? If we kind of back up to this guy. Um, you know, often we're in this shared kernel environment. Well, if we've got kernel mode driver, then we've just messed with the kernel. Now every container has, has a challenge around that. So we generally try to avoid those. There's some that kind of work, but that's, that's a rough spot. I would generally avoid it. Um, uh, the other one might be UI stacks. Like the, the yeah. idea is a container is a service. So we're, you know, if you're trying to run things like on installation, it requires a UI that pops up. That's why you see like in the SQL script, there's like this checkbox to enable the EULA thing. Um, those are the things. Like it is headless services. Uh, so those are the kind of things to think about. Yeah. Uh, I have an app that is writing event source events. And that, those event source, like they stay in the isolation of the container. So I guess to yeah. collect them, I would have to install an API on the container. No, you could do, you could do uh, volumes to do that, probably. What was the question? So the question was, I've got, you know, I'm generating data inside the container. How would I actually get that out, right? Yeah. Um, so we have this notion of volumes in Docker where we can actually publish basically a, a section of the file system out to an alternate storage location. So this enables you to have really great state separation. So now you're actually defining this is the piece of state I care about versus the rest of it. Um, so there are some really great ways to do that. A <laughs> uh, blog or email list to sign up for. I tweeted out, uh, so Taylor B underscore MSFT, um, but I will talk with our marketing guys about seeing if we can get a, uh, some sort of a, a listserv set up or something we can push that out to you. Yeah? Uh, can I run the same Windows Server container on both Windows and on all things? Which one should be version before? So the question was, can I run the same Windows Server container on a Linux kernel and a Windows kernel? Uh, so you still have the limitation that a Windows container runs on a Windows kernel, a Linux container runs on a Linux kernel, because uh, they have they, they depend on that kernel API surface, right? What we're doing and that is one of the th that is one of the things about containers is they one of the things that makes them so optimized is they're able to share with the host, right? So there is that common shim to be on each one. So that's part of the reason we use the Hyper-V isolation is that that gives us a common kind of playing field so that we can make them run side by side. Uh, there's some question over there. So how well PowerShell will be sort of integrated to the container experience? Since the open source PowerShell are both on Windows, will it be like an equal? So the question was, how is PowerShell being integrated into the container ecosystem? So we did build a PowerShell module for Docker uh, that calls the Docker REST API. It's an open source project. Um, frankly, we're not seeing a ton of, uh, of adoption of it right now, but it is in the open source. Um, and we've kind of been watching it and seeing if, you know, if people really pick it up and start really going nuts for it, then we'll throw more engineering on it. Um, if people don't, then we'll kind of take that as a, a hint that the D Docker CLI and things like that are what people are, are looking for. Um, we are building container images. So one of the images that we publish is a PowerShell image for Linux as well as Windows using the open PowerShell uh, support. So if you love PowerShell on Linux, you can grab that image and PowerShell away. There's a person over there, the blue, yeah. Yeah, so the, we have 2016 images for both Windows and Linux, um, or 20, yeah, 2016, whatever it is, the latest version for Windows and Linux. We have uh, one of the older versions for Windows as well, I think it was 2014, um, and they're based on the developer edition. So the developer edition is the uh, free, free edition for developing on. Um, so they're based off of that, which has all the same features as Enterprise, uh, but is licensed for developers. Preview of 2017. It says the SQL guy from the back room. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So Luis can answer any more questions on SQL there, because I picked his brain for about two hours yesterday, so you should do it as well. <laughs> All right. Two Anything more questions. else? Uh, roadmap for Docker features on Windows. Um, largely in my head and in John's head, I think. Um, we're continuing to add, the container, add additional container primitives to Windows. Our goal is to, to try to maintain parity with, uh, with Linux at this point and kind of keep that, that evolution moving forward. Um, my kind of general belief is that if it's good for Linux, it's probably good for Windows too, with some minor exceptions, right? Like obviously 
uh, C group changing. Well, we don't have C groups, so we use a different thing. So if there's a C group, you know, specific feature, well, we'll probably implement it in a different way. But in general, uh, trying to maintain parity. So we'll talk about networking later today, all the work we've done there. Uh, we'll talk about some of the file systems. Um, and our job is to try to squash as many of the, the di differences that we can. Right. One more question. Go to the front row. Your uh, WCF file is not published yet. Is that a private repo? The Docker file for it? Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a mistake. I'll ask them. Yeah. It should be as simple as that. It's probably as simple as that. We've been working with each there. one of the teams to basically, they're, built, they're optimizing their images. So you've, if you look at the IIS image, for example, they've optimized a bunch of stuff in IIS over the last three or four months. Things that I didn't know you could tweak in IIS, they're like, oh yeah, I just do this. I expect we're gonna see similar patterns from other teams too, which is why we like pe people pointing to the, the official images. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Um, I've got another talk later this afternoon. I'm sure I'll see some of you there. Um, and then we'll also have people around the booth. Um, so feel free to come by, ask questions, uh, get clarification. We love talking to, uh, to all of you. Thank you.